Okay, um, my name is John Wilkins. I'm uh, an honorary fellow at the University of Melbourne School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. I work primarily on uh, philosophy and history of science surrounding biology rather than physics, which is uh, the standard uh, thing to study. Um, I've published on philosophy of religion, I've published on uh, epistemology, metaphysics, as well as, of course, uh, uh, my studies on uh, evolutionary biology and taxonomy. Uh, my interest in uh, understanding is part of a general, under a general approach to uh, how science is done. So I'm primarily interested in what it is for a scientist to understand a field. To that end, I've been studying uh, the notion of a phenomenon in science and how people come to identify and perhaps construct phenomena. Uh, understanding, therefore, is something which relies on being able to identify what the phenomena are that you're seeking to understand. Um, the field of epistemology, or the study of how no knowledge is acquired and justified, uh, has typically focused very heavily on uh, propositional knowledge, that is, knowledge which can be stated uh, in exact sentences or even in mathematics. The uh, tendency over the past 30 years or so, beginning with, um, I suppose, Ian Hacking's book, Representing and Intervening, has been to um, look more at the context, the uh, pragmatics, as it's sometimes called, of knowledge, that is, what you can do with it. Knowledge as um, something which has an outcome uh, in its practice something which um, doesn't occur in a vacuum, it's not an ideal sentence, uh, it's something which occurs in a social context, in the context of where a science has gotten to in its field at the time, what instruments are available to employ and to gather knowledge. Uh, so uh, think of it as something like a microscope, uh, until Van Leeuwenhoek turned it on to uh, droplets of pond water, um, uh, there was no practical way to find out what very small scale things there were in such things as pond water, uh, other than maybe dirt. Uh, Van Leeuwenhoek uh, discovered his animalcules, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that, and um, once he had found those things which were a surprise to him, uh, people could then use the microscope to identify whether or not water was fit for consumption. So there's both a data gathering aspect to it and then an affordance, uh, something you can do with it afterwards, uh, and, and knowledge is, is in there. Now I don't want to give the idea that knowledge is something that you gather and then employ. It is a very complex dance. Uh, once you have some knowledge, you may go back and regather your um, data. You may find that you've gathered it wrongly or that there's things that you missed the first time around. And it's not just what you do, it's what other members of your uh, scientific discipline do uh, in forming an epistemic community. That is, a community of people who not only gather knowledge but evaluate other people's knowledge gathering. Uh, the way I approach it is that um, for me, understanding is not necessarily a formal process. Um, for the last two and a half thousand years since Aristotle, we've had um, this idea that to understand something is to know its causes. Understanding is the knowledge of causes, as Aristotle said, and that's been pretty much the default view ever since. Um, to find the true causes, the vera causa, uh, of, of um, uh, this or that domain. For instance, uh, Charles Darwin is regarded as having identified the vera causa of uh, uh, the uh, diversity of living things in the world today. So um, he is thought to have understood the world in a way that hadn't been understood previously. Um, I'm a little bit less happy with that than I think a lot of others are. 
in that I think while knowledge of causes is a form of understanding, it's not the only form of understanding. Uh, you can understand something you cannot put into words. In that respect, I'm a little Wittgensteinian. I think that uh, we know more than we can say, as has been said uh, before. Uh, moreover, there is knowledge and understanding which is had not by any single individual. So you might say, for example, modern physics understands quantum behavior, uh, quantum uh, mechanical behaviors, um, even if no individual in the physics community fully understands all quantum behaviors. And I'm not saying they don't, but yeah. suppose they didn't. Uh, you could have that knowledge there. You can even have knowledge which is not, well, have understanding, which is not explicitly stated or even um, self-aware in a community. Uh, an example being the, um, uh, the use of Hindu uh, holidays and rituals to regulate the use of water in Bali uh, for irrigation. The uh, Europeans came in, said, we've got a scientific knowledge of all this, uh, and basically they caused a major uh, 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 agricultural ecological collapse. Uh, when they went back to the Hindu rituals and timings, things worked again. And it happens that those rituals embodied but did not encode an understanding of the way the environment worked. So, for my money, the understanding that we have of our world is multi layered, it's not all of one kind. Uh, a lot of things are called understanding which aren't, and a lot of things aren't called understanding which are. So I've been thinking about that a fair bit uh, of recent years. Interesting. As an intuition pump, it was brought up during um, the Artificial General Intelligence Conference, the idea that can you express the object or the phenomena of uh, understanding fully in, in English? <laughs> um, well, that I guess is what epistemologists are trying to do. Uh, although it may be German or it may be Chinese these days, it doesn't have to be English. Uh, or they might uh, seek to do it in a formal language, uh, first order predicate calculus or something of that kind. Um, or just in straight mathematics. The, the thing about artificial intelligence is that it's had a very computational view of uh, understanding, I believe. Um, and while there is clearly some sort of computational element, um, I think that that bias brought about by the fact that it is in fact artificial intelligence um, is projecting a lot of uh, assumptions onto the understanding that we as human beings have. So um, I can give you an analogous e uh, example. Uh, there was somebody about 20 years ago who argued that human beings had big brains so that they could calculate the trajectories of spears when they were hunting. And that just is the classic example of uh, a mistake of um, uh, you know, category. What you can do in artificial intelligence for some aspects of cognition, is that you can reproduce it in a computational context. And if you can reproduce it in a computational content, context, it is therefore expressible in computational terms. But that doesn't mean that what's going on in our heads, or indeed in our bodies when we throw um, a spear, is computation, right? In fact, it's not computation, if we had to compute the trajectories of the things we throw, we'd never hit anything. What we do is trial and error learning until we have something that people call muscle memory, I don't think that's what it is, but until they have a trained musculoskeletal nervous system that is able to do things in a way that is, is um, uh, accurate enough to bring home the dinner. Just, just wondering at this point, can, can you like um, describe what you mean by computational and also why um, sort of learning muscular memory um, or just bringing together, you know, the sort of uh, the cognitive resources 
um, and the physiological resources in order to sort of mm. know how to throw a spear doesn't equate to any form of computation. Well, the, the thing about computation is that um, computation is a form of abstraction and drawing out the implications of that abstraction. Um, so, for instance, uh, when we throw something, we have uh, Newtonian physics behind it. Uh, if you really want to get very precise, Einsteinian physics. Um, and we can calculate the trajectory of a, a thrown object, parche wind resistance and all sorts of other things. Um, but that calculation isn't what we do. We don't sit down and, and draw that parabolic trajectory in our heads. We throw things. And if it doesn't hit, we throw it harder or in a different direction and so on until we've learned how to do it. And it wouldn't matter whether there was a computation in there or whether it was elastic bands. The fact is that you adjust the system until it gets the outcome. That's not necessarily anything we would want to call computation. The AI community, in fact, I think the um, sort of mathematical uh, sciences in general have, I think, a tendency to assume that if you can describe something in terms of mathematics, which is that computational model, that you have actually done the thing that you are describing, right? But as I often say, if you had an orrery of the universe, right, uh, of the solar system, and you could project where you would see Saturn on a particular day using that, an orrery being a mechanical model um, of the universe, that doesn't mean that uh, you have actually moved Saturn, nor does it mean that the thing that is representing Saturn weighs as much as Saturn, which is a very good thing for your, your office if that's the case, um, let alone the sun. So uh, there's a distinction to be had between concrete processes and abstract operations. Abstract operations don't happen in a particular time and place, they are just logical constructs. We construct them in a time and place, but that's not the same thing as saying that uh, thinking is computation, right? any more than throwing is computation. Um, that said, there are times when computation is actually cheaper than trying to get muscle memory so that you can throw things. For example, when you're firing a, uh, uh, a naval gun, right? It, it's better to look up the sheet and roll the thing to the right height and what have you. Uh, you're more likely to target where you want to go than if you just take a random guess and keep doing it because those shells are expensive. Um, so computation isn't, I think, universal statement of what the world is. If you describe the, the properties of an electron, right, have you actually, um, if you give a mathematical model of an electron, have you exhausted everything there is about the electron? And I think in a way Aristotle would have understood that question. He would have said, no, you've got the form, the mathematical form of an electron, but you don't have that electron because that's located as an individual particle in a particular time and place. And it's physical, not abstract. Uh, I've got a lot of positive things to say about Aristotle, unusually for a philosopher of biology, but um, um, I think that this is a, a, a category error that's made often by those working in AI. Not all the time. There are people who understand the difference between a simulation of consciousness or cognition or, or computation and the actual thing itself. So the, the, the issue that AI researchers seem to have to me is that they need to figure out the, um, to use an, uh, an old phrasing, the essence of understanding in order to implement it in their systems. Um, and hitherto, uh, they've tended to have uh, a very propositional view of understanding. So we feed the system these um, um, axioms, and from those axioms, the system can derive the implications. Now, um, computational models of that kind are very good at 
doing what computers do, that is uh, more or less rigid uh, elaboration, uh, algorithmic elaboration of, of um, uh, initial states and values and so forth. Um, in the broader context of science generally though, there's a lot of debate about what co constitutes a model. Um, and it varies according to the discipline that you're dealing with. Physicists will often say a model is a mathematical uh, structure and um, if it correctly predicts or retrodicts the, the outcomes of, of a, a setup or a state, then um, that model has to some extent been validated or, or uh, supported. Uh, in biology, though, um, people's models are a lot more, um, they have a greater degree of freedom in many ways. There are, of course, uh, numerous mathematical models in biology, particularly in ecology uh, uh, and in conservation management, places like that. The thing is that even if you are tracking individual simulations of organisms, things happen in the real world that don't happen to those simulations. And so people will say, oh, it's in the ballpark. Uh, my classic example is uh, Alan Turing, who came up with a model of what's called morphogenetic diffusion uh, of, of um, development. And he was able to show that the patterns of stripes that you get on a zebra are um, uh, can be modelled as the outcome of two growth fields uh, interacting and uh, um, uh, dif diffracting. And somebody said, so, Mr. Turing, have you explained the zebra? He said, I've explained the patterns, but not the whole horse. Um, what can happen is that you, you do a diffusion model like that, and you say, that looks like a zebra. Now, how precise do you want that to be? If I look at a particular zebra, I can almost guarantee you that your simulation will not show exactly the pattern on this actual zebra, right? Or this tiger, right? Or whatever it is that you're using, even a butterfly's wings. You will see a pattern that looks like the one simulated. Have you explained it? Now, you could be... Um, Dr. Doom and say, uh, no, I'm not going to grant you that you've explained it until you get the exact hair for hair coloration of this individual zebra in your simulation. Um, and of course, once you've done that, you've then got to do it for the next one and so forth. Um, that's not how science works. Uh, you generalize, you've got to generalize. You've got to have models which give you a class of phenomena as outcomes of the causes you're positing in your model. But then you have the problem of how much difference are you going to allow in that outcome? And how do you construct those classes of phenomena? Uh, and uh, I think, I've worried about this for about 20 years. I think the solution that I have for what it's worth is that science is a process of trading off inaccurate generalities for accurate particulars. Okay, in other words, you take a lot of data. Each one of those is precise to some degree. Each data point is precise. Um, and assuming that you have dealt with potential error in your measurements, all that sort of stuff, you want a model which is going to generate the same overall pattern that you could, for example, a graph which shows a scattering, but when you draw a uh, regression line, you get a straight line or you get a curve, right? Now you want your model to generate that curve or very close to it in order to say that you understand what's going on here on the basis of your model. But your model's never going to be exact. It's never going to quite get that individual zebra, right? Um, some years back, Sony had a wonderful ad where they bounced all of these coloured balls down a San Francisco street. It's absolutely beautiful to watch. And I remember thinking at the time, 
everything that's happening there is determined by physics, but a physicist could not tell you where exactly each ball would go. Uh, and the reason for that is that the calculation depends on very, very minor differences uh, in what things are bouncing on, and also in the fact that it's a massive computation. And therefore, to do this on a regular basis is intractable. So to understand things can't mean that we are calculating the outcomes of our models in fine detail. Okay? And effectively what we're doing is we're summarizing, we're generalizing and summarizing when we do our modeling. And understanding is coming up with a summary. But how accurate? The answer to that, I think, has something to do with what you can do with it. Um, now, I don't think to say that I understand how to uh, uh, draw a Feynman diagram has anything to do with how nicely I can draw it on the, on the blackboard, if I were able to draw those things, which I'm not. Um, but if I can't at least draw something that looks like a Feynman diagram, I can't say I understand the processes that that diagram represents in subatomic physics. So understanding there is shown by my ability to express the understanding in the terminology that my community of physicists would understand themselves and therefore validate my knowledge, right? And then we can argue about whether or not the uh, diagram I've drawn is a, the best one to draw, all that sort of stuff. But if I were repairing a motorcycle and I wasn't very good with words and I knew no mathematics, I couldn't even draw very well, but I could pull apart my motorcycle and grind the heads and, you know, tune it and reassemble it, tune it and all that sort of stuff. Um, do I not understand how to fix a motorcycle because I can't express it, because I can't... No, of course I do, but I am showing the understanding and, in fact, I would say having the understanding in the doing of it. So some understanding of, it, of things is expressed, other understanding is simply done. Not all of it is computation, not all of it is uh, propositional statements. Uh, so this trade-off between generality and accuracy in science is part of a more general phenomenon of understanding. And I would say that understanding is knowing what patterns occur in a particular domain or field or area of expertise. So to say I understand the ideal gas law, which is the one that everybody, the example that everybody uses, uh, means that I can calculate the pressure of a gas if I know its temperature and volume, fundamentally, and the constant that applies to that particular gas or mixture of gases. So it's P equals VT over K or something of that kind, or PV equals, no, uh, I can't remember now, but um, the point being that um, if I do um, calculate from this ideal gas law what my one mole of hydrogen is going to, uh, you know, what pressure it's going to have uh, in a space of, say, one litre, um, am I going to be absolutely accurate? To some degree, yes, I am. I'm going to be much more accurate than if I simply did a guess or uh, used a mechanical solution to figure it out, you know, like having a stick pushing against an elastic membrane and, uh, you know, something of that kind. But then again, I could repeat that exercise many times and I'll guarantee you I will get a different result each time when I measure it to a high degree of accuracy. And this is a general problem of, um, of science that multiple measurements, each of which is precise, will vary. And so uh, precision and accuracy are not the same thing, fundamentally. Um, so to know that I understand how gases, pressure and temperature interact doesn't mean I have an exact solution, right? 
I have a solution which is exact plus or minus, and that is regarded as good enough for uh, filling, you know, Falcon 9 uh, tanks with uh, super chilled oxygen or something like that. Um, and if I'm off by, a, you know, a tenth of a percent, it doesn't really matter. On the other hand, it might very well matter if I'm trying to do some uh, high energy physics with that super chilled oxygen. So I might need to know exactly. And that's when it becomes a problem. You can say, well, we don't understand how it behaves to that degree of accuracy or in those conditions until we actually do it. And then we find out. In the end, it becomes trial and error. So accuracy and precision are trade-offs in science, just as generality and specificity are trade-offs. In other words, you might know about the general and you might know about the precision, but you're not necessarily accurate about the particular thing.